I think it's always been the case that parents care about their children. And parents, uh, you would hope, in the vast majority of cases, your parent loves you um, for all time. It's that unconditional love. No matter how much you disgrace your family, your parents love you, you would hope. Um, but that used to be people's private business. And it's not to say that people don't speak to other people about how they bring up their children. But this idea of bringing in a third party professional, and even if you look at the research that's been done and the ideas that are advocated, it changes over time. Um, you know, and today, there are all sorts of different views about how you should bring up your children. Um, so it's not like, it, you know, it, it's not, for example, if you discovered, uh, if you investigated a rock. You could look at a rock, you could do some scientific study, and you could say, this is what a rock is made of. Um, you know, this is its molecular composition. When you're talking about interpersonal relationships, there is no defined science on parenting. And parenting used to be about just having children and bringing up your children. Now it's much more about a discussion about the behavior of parents. So parents who smoke are, um, are sort of like, that's like the worst thing you could possibly be is a parent that smoke. Uh, a parent that puts their child under pressure, which in the old days used to be seen as that's a great thing, you want your child to be successful um, and, and to make it in the world, that's seen as negative. Even to the point now where people teach kids to play baseball and somehow it's supposed to be not competitive because there's this discussion about that's bad for the kid's self-esteem. Um, and I suppose, really, I think when we're talking about children and parenting, we should be thinking about what type of adults do we want the next generation to be? And, and I think that we're projecting our fears about the, you know, the current way society is onto our children, and we're bringing on our children actually not to be able to cope with adversity. Um, our, our motivation for doing the series on risk was really that there are a lot of issues today, whether it's um, to do with anxiety amongst parents, whether it's to do with the fact that people feel quite vulnerable and fragile, um, you know, whether it's not, whether it's something, even something like people feel a bit in awe of environmental change. And there are numerous issues today, but people don't really connect the dots. And um, so what we wanted to do is just to explore various aspects of uh, particular issues where we think that um, risk and fear and the whole notion that um, you know, people as individuals, uh, you know, there's two sides you can look at it. Either you know, we're completely uh, susceptible to outside forces or you know, what we used to call in the old days robust, enlightened man and woman, of course, is able to deal with anything that the world throws at us. Um, and I think that you know, the, one of the, dis the discussion that we're having on parenting is a very good example of that because it's not just about parenting and, and it's not just about children. It's about how we feel as adults and it's much more about how we as adults feel quite vulnerable and unconfident in terms of our adulthood and we then project our fears and anxiety uh, onto our children. It's particularly a product of the period that we're in at the moment that um, I think, you know, even maybe 10, 20 years ago, people had much more of a sense that they were part of something. Whether it, whether it was that they were part of a church, whether it was a part, they were part of the Boy Scouts, whether or not it was, they were part of some sort of labor movement organization, whatever it was. And people felt that they were part of something and they had some frame of reference in terms of interpreting the world. There was much more of discussion about the type of world we want to live in. And it's true that we all didn't agree, but there was what you, you, you could call a clash of ideas about our vision for the future, whether it was forward-looking, which was traditionally associated with a more left-wing perspective or whether it was more um, backward-looking which was traditionally associated with a conservative perspective there was that sense that um, people could do something about the world we were living in and it gave, that gave people a frame of reference for interpreting everything from their public life and, and obviously that also influenced their private life one of the things that I think is a problem at the moment is things that used to be just uh, you know it's people's private business now there is a public discussion about it um, and that's what I think is a problem that we don't even have the confidence to manage our own relationships without bringing in you know some um, somebody actually who we don't know a complete stranger to talk about the most intimate details of our interpersonal relations how we bring up our children um, and then obviously on, on a more global scale uh, you know we have the whole, whole discussion to do with the environment 
Well, it depends what you mean by better safe than sorry. If you say to me, do you want to walk on I-95, uh, which is, you know, um, the route I take to work, I would say that's a pretty stupid thing to do. Um, you know, if you're going to say to me, you know, do you want to walk in the middle of 8th Avenue? That's a pretty stupid thing to do when all the cars are coming down. But what we're talking about is an outlook in terms of the way we observe the world and interact with the world where we're very much retreating. And if you look at the progress that people have made over the past three, four hundred years, it's been based on people, um, you know, actually going for it. Um, if you just look at something like um, penicillin. You know, penicillin, uh, we weren't quite sure of the reaction to penicillin, but someone was prepared to give it a go, um, you, know, to, you know, to take a risk. And uh, penicillin is responsible for, so for saving millions of lives. And I think that's what's dangerous. Even to the point where if you look at something like Africa, there are a million people a year who die of malaria in Africa each year, mainly older and younger people. Because there is this, well, better safe than sorry, we couldn't possibly spray um, the area with DDT. Uh, even though there is no proven connection that that is a bad thing to do for adults. And I think it's just, it's a reflection of the times that we live in, that people are not prepared to think about solving problems. It's very much that we give in to the problems that we face. I would say what we're trying to, to do is to recreate that sense of the public and public discussion. And um, one of the things that we pride ourselves on is that we're not afraid of people disagreeing with us. And in fact, the reason why we put on our smaller events and the larger public events like this one with the New School is because we want to encourage people to discuss things as thoroughly as possible. Because, you know, I can chat to my friends and, you know, we probably agree on a lot of things. It doesn't actually take, take me forward in terms of my thinking. And I suppose we're not afraid of other people's ideas because at the end of the day, people think what they think for a reason. And so what we're trying to do through the New York Salon is to recreate that sense of serious discussion where you don't get offended because someone disagrees with you. We're not that fragile. If you disagree with what I have to say, you have a responsibility to challenge me on that. And if I disagree with you, then I have a responsibility to discuss that with you. And maybe we don't completely agree all of the time. Maybe we never agree. Um, but the important thing is that we have that debate in public.